that introduction, Chris, is uh, fantastic. I just want to thank the Rice of Design Alliance. Wow. Um, to, uh, that's great. Uh, to have um, uh, invited me, and uh, it's really been a terrific uh, 24 hours, I must admit. Um, and I got a fantastic tour today of Houston, which is very revealing, um, of all aspects, um, the political machinations, as well as sort of just the urban fabric and how that responds to, to the conditions. Um, so I've had a terrific time. So thank you very much once again, uh, Catherine and Stephen, for taking me on that tour. It was very revealing. And thanks a lot, Chris, for once again a great intro. Um, I, I, I'm here, uh, and I think it's uh, quite an interesting... Um, uh, I'm excited to be here because I, I've sort of described it as three different um, sort of strands coming together of architecture. One with regards to the fine arts being hosted in this building, two, um, architecture students, and three, the professionals of architecture. And that's where all my worlds come together and collide. So I'm really excited and, and I'm very happy to accept this invitation for that reason. So I'm going to try and really uh, operate um, <laughs> at all three levels simultaneously. Now it's not going to be easy, but I really hope you can stay with me uh, because the worst thing that can happen in a lecture, as I've experienced many times myself, is that it becomes like rap music. You know, you kind of get the tones and you get the rhythm and the beat, but you don't listen to the words. And I really hope that you stay with the words because that's really the power of some of the work. Um, um, just one more note uh, is that I would really, I will turn into a pop pumpkin in 16 minutes, and that's just a given. So uh, it's not going to be long, but hopefully um, it'll have a beat. Um, so I also would like to start with small scale work and then build up to high rises because I should just say that we've really been working hard to develop techniques that are transportable in scale. And I know digital media allows us to do that, but it's not easy to do that. So a lot of our exploration went through uh, different scales of work, and I'm going to show you those scales because the relationships between them are crucial to the development of what Chris just defined, or Chris just mentioned, um, and of the London's definition, of elegance. I mean, it is a coherence, a complexity, a series of complex maneuvers that come across elegantly, but materials, structure, systems, all coming together in a manner where it seems effortless. But I have to tell you, just working on this for the last 19 years, it's not easy. So that's why I want to show you the the sort of the way we have been thinking about it and the way the materials and structure come together to develop a coherent logic. So I'm going to start with a book and I'll end at a high rise. So just to show you my book. <laughs> um, and uh, it's an important project, an important project for us. But anyway, we can move on now. Um, <laughs> So we are looking, uh, one of our uh, really important projects um, was developing a mold system because we realized that we were looking at um, surfaces that were really um, very finely inflected and the inflection to any surface takes a lot of manufacturing. You have to build a positive and then you go to a negative mold, and then you go back to a positive. So because we were designing a series of furniture pieces with variations, we began to look at a system that might be able to yield these surfaces in very particular manners. And those manners, the manner was to somehow bring down the cost by developing our own machine that could just go to a positive situation. So. If you look here, it's a mold system that we developed in Bangkok, China. And we were really looking at the inflection of the surface 
and the surface itself taught us a lot about how it's structured. So the structure of the grid, for example, on the bottom left, right, is, excuse me, uh, on bottom left is a grid, but we realize that in an inflected surface, the structure operates more like in steel, where there flows of forces that get heightened at the inflection points. And so those inflection points allowed us to inflect a robotically driven machine to different levels to then get the inflections that we required in the piece of furniture. Now the, the idea of the furniture was to catalyze its surrounding, um, surrounding um, relationships and what I call formations of how people in, are able to interact with the piece of furniture or our architecture. So in this case, it's really about not providing any real way of leaning against it or sitting against it or lying against it, but really to incorporate all the other ranges that people could um, use and perform with the piece of furniture. So you could lean against it and lay on it, but you couldn't quite sit on it. You'd be very uncomfortable. So what happens is it develops then a range of other condition. So if someone leans against it, then other people begin to lay around. And if some people sit on it, then you sit on it. And at the opening in artist space, when this was launched, people actually uh, were all over it. It wasn't on uh, a base, it wasn't on a plinth, but people were really interacting with it. And I think that that was a crucial goal, is to try and look at that. And then it became a series and a variation of that piece of furniture that was then launched at the International Furniture Show. So that the research then behind is as crucial as the product for us, but we really like developing the product. So Chris mentioned parametrics, and I just want to go into it a little bit. The parametric software that's out there currently and how we use it uh, is very particular. Uh, there are two components, and one, uh, and this is important for us, um, the, the numerical relationship is how we control the points on the screen there, right? So the numerical is controllable, controllable plus one, minus one, etc. And with intensity and differential geometry, the intensity uh, between the points and the rate of change between the points is what develops what's really crucial, is the virtual capacity. And the virtual capacity is what allows for that green dot to begin to move. That's moving on the screen, right? So the virtual capacity is not virtual reality, right? It's really a space of potential. It's a space of something to happen which is not foreseen through just purely looking at the numerical. So as you begin to work with this, you develop a series of um, iterations. So it's very iterative and you can begin, this is exactly the same setup, by the way, that it's, you begin to really uh, develop an aesthetic sensibility and that aesthetic sensibility is due to this notion of iteration. So you go back to the numerical, you begin to understand how the virtual capacity is operating, then you allow the virtual capacity to continually develop an aesthetic sensibility. So the numerical and the virtual are inextricably linked in our work, but the virtual brings forward a lot of things, as again was mentioned in the introduction, um, that mo modernism did not deal with. So with the same dynamical system, you begin to go into a way of thinking about those issues and aesthetics, particularly for us with regards to elegance. And what that does is it shifts the way we think about program to uh, intensities, just as the parametric system, right? So the parametric system gives us a lot of terrain to operate with. We don't only look at it to build something, right? Like a lot of the profession practices today are doing. We conceive of ideas all the way through construction using parametrics. So not only how does space and program change, but how does the entire way of thinking about material organizations coming together change? And how would that produce an effect on culture, on inhabitation, on um, things that are more localized in the city, etc. right? So how does it influence the urban condition? So for example, in this, we won a competition uh, for the Greek Olympics a long time ago, um, but unfortunately the funds went to uh, fund the security. 
Um, but the intensity then in the program is really how different programs begin to coexist with others and how they come together and they differentiate. So if it's in incredibly intense, you can do one thing, like you can sit in a cafe or in another area, you can, you can walk or lay down, or then there are hybridized conditions and relationships. And those hybridized areas begin to come together to, to form surfaces. Now this is due to our goal in the project. It's for the Olympics, so we tried negating all of culture cultural, gender, uh, gender related differences by saying, okay, let just the scale of the human body determine how you begin to use the building. So we allowed that to happen. Uh, so if you're, if you're a large person, you begin to slide off surfaces. If you're small, you can begin to sit on them as seating areas, etc. So as I said, we go all the way through with these with parametric systems, and we we have to work with budgets. So the budgets allow us to begin to look at how much money we can put in to a particular effect that we want to achieve. So in this project, the budget was incredibly low. So we pretty much used single curved, which are yellow, and double curved sur surfaces only in very, very um, select areas, because that's all the project <laughs> could sustain with the budget. So we allowed that to happen, and we basically go back and alter the, par the parametric relationships to control again how much area we could afford of double curvature. And then obviously it goes into the factory, and uh, you know you, you do prototypes and test panels, uh, etc. And then the structure is incredibly simple. So, due to the budget, the structure is much more expensive to to change and to relate to the formal capacity of the building. So what we do is, for this project and the next one I'm going to show, it's really about looking at um, how to restrain the structural conditions and how to animate the surficial relationships. And I'll go, go into that in a minute. So what happens when you work with the virtual? What happens is you get another terrain of information that you didn't have before. And that would be affect. Now, I know that everyone has heard this term. It's similar to getting an affect from a painting. But the way we control these affects um, are through the relationship of the light and the surface. So in this, for example, in this animation, the surface is not moving or changing at all. Just the lighting relationships on the surface are changing. So you can see where it's pleasant to sit, where the edge, same edge, becomes incredibly foreboding. You would never go there. And as it gets darker, it gets more and more. You know, you just are repelled from it, right? So this is just showing how it operates. So why is that important? Well, it's different than effects. Now, as I said, the numerical and the virtual go together, right? So in this case, the numerical relationship is forming let me just do this one more time. The numerical relationship is forming the surface and how it is, right? You can measure it in quantity. The lighting is bringing the qualitative aspects forward, right? And so why is that important or interesting? Well, if you think about cause and effect, right? The, the problem here was we have a surface and we have two different modes of transportation. One is vehicular and the other is pedestrian. How do we make them coexist? The effect is the difference in the, uh, the six inch difference of the curve, right? So the cause was that and the effect was that. Affects are slightly different in that they operate in ways that are unpredictable. So for example, a skateboarder can use this or a child can sit on the curve like we all know. Skateboarder can skateboard on it and then it has further and further consequences. So the skateboarder then falls off, breaks his arm, is in pain, goes to the hospital. In hospital, the, a nurse takes care of him, he falls in love, has children, <laughs> etc. Right? So it keeps on producing further and further affect. And so that's going to be the relationship of how they operate within the project. So if you begin to look here, as I was describing, 
larger bodies being able to slide down these surfaces or people being able to sunbathe, looking at updates on screens for the Olympics. This, it all can begin to come together. So lighting plays a crucial role. So if the intensity of program is high, for example here, it completely opens up to the sky because you don't need further affects. But as it begins to become more, more intricately intertwined with other programmatic conditions, you can really highlight the relationship of how the surface is and what sort of moods and atmospheres <coughs> begin to occur within the project. And the intention is really to feel, you know, like traveling in the 60s, right? It's, it's an elegant experience. You dress up and you go through it. And so that's how we really conceive of these issues. So in Shanghai, we did a, a project in Xintiandi uh, for Reebok. And Reebok uh, came up with a new brand strategy, which was uh, where the vector outperformed. So we said, okay, we have to begin to work with the local conditions and the site, but we also have to begin to allow this brand to just take over, and it should be everywhere. How do you spatialize that brand strategy? So we're talking about movement, about speed, about how the environment can really encapsulate this brand. So there were a, f there were a couple of conditions that we had to deal with. It was an existing building, and we didn't design it, and it has an incredibly hard concrete facade which negates the size and scale of the space. They needed enough space for Yao Ming to be able to throw a basketball to have some frontage at a much larger scale. So we began to develop a series of then, you know, parametric <coughs> systems which allowed for the surface of the back of the store to become available and to become uh, usable in a particular way, and then we decided that the spaces around that should just be, inha should be inhabited by the products as necessary. Now, Reebok went along with that for a little bit, but they said, you know, we need a shoe bar. We need one area we can sh showcase all our shoes. So we said, all right, we can do that for you, as long as all the shoes are the same color. We let you have the shoe box. Right? So, so in, in any case, this is an interesting negotiation, and clients play a very big role in the projects. Please don't, I mean, this is how it works. So what we did, uh, and I'll show you the, um, how the shoe bar is actually moved off of the back surface, and then uh, the entire store reveals itself around that move. These are the panelizations of the project, and I have to say that the parametrics and the initial intention of the project was maintained. But again, the form of the project was not maintained. It just became better because the relationships became tighter. And how that happened was through budgetary constraints again. They could only spend a certain amount of money. And what we decided again in Reebok was we have to have the simplest, simplest structure but we have to really look in at surfaces and begin to see how we can develop a series of surf surfaces that repeat, but in different locations, so the eye could never put that together. And from there, we use seams that always cross the grain of the material joint, so you never notice the joint. So these are very particular intentions of ours, and I think if you don't have those and you don't have the sensibility, then you can get lost in what what parametrics can do for you instead of controlling it. So we're really interested in controlling it. The other area that was very important was the interior facade. We couldn't touch the outside glass, but we really molded um, uh, plastic, actually. And the more you molded the plastic, the taller it could hold itself up. So we had quite large um, you know, four meter runs of this. So we had to mold it at a particular point without going too much, because if you went too much, then again, because of the milling of the pan of the um, molds, right, you would mill them, it becomes much more expensive. So we allowed the panelization then to occur on the molds in a very particular manner, which again met the budgetary constraints. We couldn't quite use the mold machine on this because we, uh, the edges and how the edges come together. 
become a real issue, actually, when you do that. So in a furniture where only two panels go together, it works, but when you have a series, it becomes more difficult. So the structure is very simple. It's a Virendil truss, which is hung off the, the structure itself, and then it's just laser cut. It's all assembled off of site and then brought in to the store, or into the space. So this is what it looked like on the outside. And what we've done is we've done a lot of prototypes, the pieces of this, um, which are available, and then added a sport over Reebok, but in any case. The story. So the idea again is to get this dynamism in the city, in Shintandi, which is an interesting area in Shanghai. And this is the surface of the wall that I was talking about. So we pulled it out. Yao Ming, who is uh, uh, their most prestigious signee in uh, China, could shoot a basketball. But then if you look at the other surfaces, the way they operate is either for merchandise or people can sit and have Yao Ming sign, sign things that just purchased in the store. But what, what was fascinating about this uh, discussion is that the store manager actually becomes a curator because depending on the products and the way they're located within the store, the activity changes within the store itself. So for example, this is a view of the shoe bar. People can try on shoes and lean against that surface and the shoes on the right surface of the wall. But then all these surfaces, you're not able to see this on the projection, but they're incredibly um, seamed. And those seams allow for different merchandise to be located there. So as you begin to change the merchandise and their locations, the relationship of how people begin to interact with them changes. So this view is really what shows how the entire store unravels itself with this dynamism through it, which makes the brand uh, apparent. And so you can see, as you're moving through the store, you can see the shoes on the right, you can begin to sh see how the uh, variation of the surfaces and the outside fa facade are beginning to change. And the most important difference from a regular store is actually the lighting. The lighting is gradiented so that the intensity of light can begin to illuminate um, particular merchandise, but not in a one-to-one -one manner, right? So depending on where you so one can begin to move the merchandise and see how much attention you want to attract to it by the intensity of lighting. So it's similar to the programmatic condition. This project is a f uh, was for a fashion designer in London, outside London. I can't mention who it is, uh, but by the location of the site, if you're familiar with England, you should know. And she has a store in New York, so that's really limited. So if you think about fashion, you'll be able to figure out who it is. Um, but here, again, the problem was twofold. Uh, she wanted a weekend residence for herself and her family, but she also wanted a place where she could bring her best clients and pitch a new collection to, right? So it's, again, got this hybridized condition and relationship. So we looked at really the landscape. This is really phenomenal. And we looked at the landscape and we really began to understand how the landscape could perform. Sometimes at retention ponds, and if it's in summer, people can swim. Sometimes for irrigation channels. And other times when it was dry, for models walking down the catwalks. Right? So the idea, once again, is to really try and combine these dy dynamic series of moments into something which is obviously does not move, but it has the capacity to change. This is something else that these systems bring forward to us, parametric systems, is that there, there's never one equilibria, but there's multiple equilibria that occur simultaneously. So the multiple equilibria is a fascinating problem to deal with as architects. So the way we dealt with it uh, in this project is to have different circulation routes that would come together in different ways to provide and provoke different interactions within the different situations of the project. Now, as I said, we're very interested in light. So we're not interested in kind of making it more efficient or less efficient, although that's important, don't get me wrong, but we're also interested in uh, varying the lighting conditions as much as possible to have that spawn completely different interactivities 
and interactions in the interior of the space. So when we took this to the building department in the UK, they said each one of these things that you've designed has to be a window in its own right. Um, so I think that you know the next step forward is really to begin to change some building codes, building laws, three-dimensional models and sort of floor plans, etc. But so we did. So we had to take that idea and translate it into something that had you know each window had its own um, um, waterproofing, etc., membrane, drip, etc. But it really adds to the interior atmosphere of the project. So it's important to do. Um, this is a model looking uh, again through the channels that run under the, the space of the house. And the other side is actually the parking, uh, which comes in and it's embedded actually halfway underground. So you come in, you park, you move in, and then you can enter the house. And this is the other side towards the landscape. So uh, once again, these multiple circulation routes were really crucial. Um, and we really looked at how to move through the house in, at different speeds, at different rates. Um, so there's one rate that move, moved up to the roof. There's another rate that went directly down into the landscape. The third rate was a very slow meandering all the way through the house. But these drawings are really important, not for us, but how to explain the idea to a contractor. Because he just could not understand a you know, three-dimensional model. It's really complex, but they understand drawings. And the drawings are a particular vehicle for us to really explain the idea. Because it's a normal, you know, since we're in a medical city, it's just a series of section cuts, much like an MRI that you can reveal the entire spatiality of the project in one drawing. So we had to also become good at just being able to explain what the intention and the idea was immediately. So at the end of this project, we, we began to realize that the, we can have two completely different systems, the structure of the roof, which is some monocoque shell, and the base, which is concrete. And one can actually literally take the roof off if one wants and put on a new one. So the client said, well, that's great. That's like fashion design. You I mean every five years, I can change the roof of the building to have a different aesthetic? I said, absolutely, as long as we're the architect. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> so, so here again, um, so you can move up, like I was saying, and remember, the models also moving through the space, right? So you have to begin to picture the models moving down the stairs, into the landscape, etc. This is a view of the entry. And, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But the whole sort of unraveling of space was really incredibly important. And I think that that's really what differentiates us from a lot of people using parametric software is that they work on surfaces. We're really interested in working on space. So how can space begin to operate parametrically? This is a view, once again, looking back at the house with the surface of, the, uh, of each individual window. And this is the view as you walk in. So the, the models can move from the top right on the second surface. They can actually change in the bedrooms, come back, come down, and walk into the landscape. The people can lean or sit or rest against this with a cocktail in their hand, or then you can have a very restful experience just as a residence, and the children can begin to uh, sit on the benches, and uh, or then go directly down into the landscape, and they can run around. And so there again, it's a plethora of different relationships that we are interested in encapsulating, uh, particularly with particularly with these. Um, hybridized conditions of what the client's intentions and needs were. So here, once again, is where the models were brought down and out. This project is almost done. Uh, first phase, it's uh, part of a three-phase project in Tokyo. The first phase is renovating an existing set of clinics. The second phase is to build a new building in Omoto Santo, and this is our site. It's really Tokyo is a fantastic city. I'm in love with it. It is really a futuristic city that I cannot believe every time I'm there. 
and find new, new interesting conditions. So that's the Yogi Park up there, back in Vatangi. Um, and then the green filters into what is a local sando, right? So let me just show you that. So the green belt comes down, and that's a motosanda. So it's the Champs Elysees of, of Tokyo. So we're currently working on a building on that uh, stretch of land. And the first phase, uh, once again, uh, it's, it's actually the most famous orthodont. I don't know why, but orthodontists and I get along really well. <laughs> but it, it's the most famous Asian orthodontist. And he developed a technique to straighten teeth in 12 months, and you don't see anything on the outside. And it's not Invisalign, because he claims Invisalign doesn't work. So it's fascinating to see that he developed this mechanism. He has two PhDs, one in palatology and one in orthodontics. And he brought his knowledge in both fields together to develop this mechanism. So he's incredibly precise, and very interested in leading the future. And as we know, in Tokyo, 97% um, are followers, but the 3%, if you find them and you speak with them, they're really looking towards what's next. How do we begin to fathom these ideas? So once again, the restraints in Tokyo are incredible. Fire, earthquakes, etc. So in this condition, we weren't, the, the fire marshal did not allow us to cant any surface. He said, if you can't it, you've got to pay for the structure to hold it. So what we did was we set up a series of relationships of parametric conditions, which is so, I mean, it's an orthodontic clinic. So you have incredible HVAC systems, electrical systems, it's medical care. And what we were able to do is test the limits of those conditions that were given to us to still develop something that for him needed to be um, not seen in Tokyo before. He kept saying, I can't, if I go in anywhere and I see it, and he did a lot of research, which is interesting, in old Tokyo architecture. So what we did was we developed, uh, once again, a series of scenes that began to operate with not only all the equipment, but with the entire functioning of the clinic. So we looked at how to move uh, LED lights, the seams, the joints, and how they all began to cooperate to produce this um, unbelievable atmosphere for his clients, who are all models and fashion designers, right? So how do you begin to cater to them? Uh, and he also has this amazing, he thinks that a nice smile can alter one's life. So it's, he's got very big ideas and we're just small, a small piece in his <laughs> intentions. So if you begin to look at the milling, uh, and it's interesting in Tokyo, you would think that they can do anything. But actually on interior scale work, they're not very technically proficient, only on large scale buildings. So we're excited to get going on that. But if you begin to look here, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there is, um... oh, great, thank you. Let me just show this to you, because it's, um... A lot of work. <laughs> Where? Okay, great. Thanks. So, if you begin to look here, there's actually a groove that moves from this surface down to this surface, right? And it's completely continuous. Now, imagine doing that, right? And only on a three axis mill, and it's not easy. So, just the craft of putting this material together is still important. You can get it completely right in the, in the actual fabrication drawings, but to be able to put it into an existing location and have them align is very difficult because obviously the existing relationships are not perfect, right? They're not perfect to the drawings. So it's, it's been really fascinating. And it's, this is going to be published very soon, so I can't show you really finished photographs, but you can begin to, I'll show you some, an understanding of what it's going to be. Um, once again, uh, a series uh, of materials, so this, these are soft, ultra-suede covered materials on top of wood that converts into the flooring. So again, it's really 
many different materials coming together, although looking as if it's completely seamless. But we use that because we allow the LED lights, etc., to begin to differentiate the material capacity for us. So we can get completely different materials, but you still visually understand them as being linked and continuous. And the variation there is crucial in producing that effect. And we just try and mine it for all its potential. So this is, again, one of the benches within one of the clinics. And the seams come, again, off of the flooring. So this is completely continuous in the floor. They rise up, they, they end, and then they go on and they continue in the panelization. You can actually see, see them here in their built version. <coughs> so the intention then of the clinic was to really <coughs> increase the size of the clinic, um, the experience of the clinic, um, but also to really develop um, a serious orthodontic clinic with a component which is incredibly uh, open for um, entertainment, etc., because he entertains, again, uh, some of his best clients uh, in this space. So this is a really good example. This is one of the, uh, just a, how the balconies begin to operate. And you can see how the LED seams go around and from the surface of the wall, from the inside to the outside, and come back in and connect into the interior. So the continuity from the inside to the outside is there. And the, the relationship of the planters to the surface this is really what I'm talking about. It's kind of, it's laser cut, it's milled, the plant is inserted. All of these conditions come together to give you an aesthetic that seems really simple, but behind it, there's a, an incredible rigor of logic of how these things come together to produce particular things that we want to achieve with the goal and intention of our clients in mind. So this is just the first uh, round, which is just laser cut. It's self-perpetuated um, watering system, etc. And then the planters, and then, as I said, then the middle panels on top with the LED, the LED lights and the seaming that continue to the interior. And the compression space, one side of the city to then just opening it up towards the other side. So the, the whole relationship of the space was crucial. Here's a project in Karachi, Pakistan that we won a competition for. They're trying to do, um, uh, it's, it's an amazing place, by the way. Uh, it's uh, 12 million people. And uh, this is a central access. This is where all the clubs are. And this is in the center of the city. And what we were fascinated by is that they're, they're Patterns everywhere in the city. Patterns upon them. You know, Edward Darrell Stone. He has, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't say this, but this is an Edward Darrell Stone building. Uh, what this is really fascinating for me. Uh, I'm not going to say what I was going to say because this is going to be put on to a website, so I can't <laughs> say, say what I didn't want to do. But um, what's fascinating about that stone project is that the, the two surfaces of the Brisolai and the windows are separate. So this project, we just said we need to bring those systems together and influence the spatiality. So when we began to work on those issues, we began to realize that once again, you have to drain it. The monsoon, the monsoon really pours a lot of water into these uh, into this area once a year. So you have to begin to again develop retention ponds, begin to allow them to um, slowly drain out. And so what we did for the city was we gave the city two buildings in one. They said they wanted a library, and what we did was we converted the library into inhabiting the floor slab of the building and gave the rest of the building back to the city so people could begin to perform, people could begin to read and do other activities. So there were two disparate systems that integrated into each other to develop a completely different notion for architecture. And this is something I'd like to talk a little bit about because the typology here is unrecognizable. And that's important for a civic building in that part of the world because you want something that's unrecognizable and then reveals itself through experience. So people can move through the building without really interacting 
with the library all the way up to the cafe. And the government, the local government said they wanted an active roof so that you could bring people up there. So that was really a lot of the problem. This is a view looking in from the outside. Once again, you can see the lighting and how it has different intensity in different areas as the surface begins to uh, change a little bit. And those areas, again, activate different conditions. Performances, uh, they activate um, lectures, read, people reading, uh, and then this system moves through and goes up, right? But as you can see, you really don't notice the library. You have to go around the corner and dip into the floor slab to get to the stacks. So the relationship then between these two systems, but hybridizing into one building, was really how we were able to achieve our goal of bringing the Briseli and the window system together. Okay, there's one image. So this is once again a view looking up towards the roof and towards where the cafe is and, and the entire roof being populated. So the intention once again of the, of the local uh, government was because it's been, the site has been taken away from the city for, for so long to really try and activate it once more. Now we can move into the tall buildings. So what I've tried to show you is really a development, and it's obviously not sequential, but a development of a way of thinking about architecture, as well as how param parametrics can not only influence the way we think about all the design issues, but also the fabrication issues. And this then goes into how we look at tall buildings. Now Dubai, that's where both our projects are. Uh, and I don't need to talk too much about Dubai because now it's a very known commodity. When we were first hired to work there, it was 2003 and to the end of 2002, so people knew less about it. But Dubai is, Dubai had a problem. It's running out of oil, right? So they wanted to shift the economy from an oil-based economy to a tourist-based economy. So what, they've, what they did was they spent a lot of money and a lot of funds on bringing this tourism to the forefront. So they spent a lot of money, right, on Federer and Agassi coming to play tennis on the helipad of the only seven-star hotel in Dubai, which sort of works. But the major thing that they did to achieve their goals was twofold. One, they changed the law of ownership of any real estate in Dubai. First of all, you had to have a partner, and you could only own 49% of any real estate transaction, any apartment or any business, 49%, and you had to have a local partner. So they changed, they abolished that, so you can own 100%. And the second was that they would, not only would, could you purchase it, but what they would do for you in response to you purchasing it is to give you a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the amenities for free, for one, but also they would give you a residential visa for six years. So you can imagine, right after 2001, all the money started pouring into Dubai, right? Uh, after, and from the region, and everyone in the region wanted to have a safe haven away from their own country. So Dubai became the place. And you can see that registering. If you look at the zoning development, it's, uh, it's actually fascinating because it changed incredibly slowly, right? 1995, 1990, 1995, 2000, 2003, and today there are no zoning restraints on Sheikh Zayed's Road. Sorry, I should mention this is Sheikh Zayed's Road, where a pro one of our projects is. Um, and currently, it's, as long as you can build it, you can go that tall. But there was an interesting moment where a lot of buildings got stuck in the middle right, where you had uh, people just wanting the tallest building. And, and you all know this because Barj Dubai, designed by SOM, is going to be the tallest building in the world and it's opening on December 12th. So the mentality is there, and that's what I want to try and get across to you. This is Sheikh Zayed's road. These are all the towers that I was just showing you. 
And on one side, you have uh, single family villas <laughs> towards the ocean, which is here. And on the other side, you have desert. And then in the middle, you have these towers. So coming back to what I was just saying about being caught in the middle, if you look at that, you know that it was caught between two zoning, zoning heights, right? And they were given legal um, rights to go this high, but then before they finished the construction, they were to go to the next level. And as they went to the next level, they just added a stake horse. It's completely useless, but they have to be the tallest possible at that point in time. So our project was different in that our, uh, our client said, we have two major problems. One is that we have, uh, because of 9-11, people are now worried to live high up in the air. So we have to figure out a circulation system with enough opportunity for, for difference through the building uh, that makes our clients comfortable. And number two is we can't sell the middle of the building. We just, it's just not happening. So what can we do? We said, it's quite easy. Why don't we put two middles, right, in the building? And having done this, we can make those units the largest units with the shortest ceiling height. So if you look, there are, this is where both towers actually hybridize. And here you can have a five bedroom apartment, right? But towards the top, they're much higher ceiling heights. So why don't you try selling this building by cubic volume and not square foot? And they loved the idea. They said, okay, that means I can sell this through cubic volume. And because they're only nine foot ceilings, the three meter high ceilings, we can reduce the rate and allow for people to live there. I said, absolutely, that's how you can sell those mid-level mid units because those are the only areas where you can get the entire floor to yourself. We loved it. So on we go. And what happened was that both of these conditions came together so that as those, those middles hybridize into one tower, that's where the circulation folds back on itself. So it breaks the tower into eight zones, eight fire zones, and that's multiplied, so it's 16, and you can move from one to the other if that zone is, uh, has a fire in it. And that was really one of the main issues of developing the form of the tower. So what we did, it was completely parametric, and what we did was that we were able to calculate square footage and cubic volume completely in real time. So as we changed the design, we got different cubic volume, and the client was sitting right there in real time, and you can fine tune basically the form and the ceiling height to maximize how many cubic feet he could sell. And that's really what resulted from our collaboration. Um, and there were other issues, privacy issues, um, a range of units, one bedroom units to four bedroom units and five bedroom units and how many of each that we could develop into one building. This is a, uh, just a close up view. So once again, if you have a neighbor here, the skirting begins to move up and close up so you can't actually begin to see. So privacy uh, is quite important. This is uh, one of the largest units, which is a, a five bedroom. This is in the middle. And I just want to show you the variation. And this is uh, one, uh, sorry, a two and a three bedroom unit. So once again, depending on where you are in the tower, you get different dimensions of units and how they begin to operate within the floor of the, of the building as well as the city. So what we did once again was develop parametric model. Now this is really, it was fascinating because the client owns a glass manufacturing plant in China. And we really looked at curvature of glass. And as we know, as you curve glass, the more you curve it, 
over 11 degrees, it becomes incredibly expensive, and 90 degree curvature is excruciating, right? You can't do it. It's impossible. So what we did was we really looked at how much curvature, once again, we could afford. So in a parametric model, we can fine tune through just by, by the relationships of the form and change the form, you can control how much money you spend on glass. And I've been collaborating with the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania, and they're able to put in direct costs into the parametric model. So as you begin to move the form, the, the height of the floors, the curvature of the tower, it spits out neural costs. So the collaboration is crucial, it's fantastic, but it's also collaborating then with scriptors in China who knew how to do this sort of work. What this did for us and our client was to remove a project manager out of the system because a project manager, whenever they see anything which does not have corners, they just triple it. They don't want to deal with it, so they just triple the cost. But here, I had to convince my client that his factory already uses these techniques. Let's go in there and begin to work simultaneously and figure this out. He said, okay, I'll give you a couple of months. Let me know. So he put me in touch with these people and we developed these models and he was unbelievably impressed. So what happened again, such as in Reebok, we were able to control the curvature of the glass. So where we needed flat glass, we got flat glass. Where we needed uh, single curved glass, we got single curved glass, and we never went to the double curved glass. It's just too expensive for the project. So now remember that we were very, uh, what's important about the work though, is that he wants an iconic building. This is not an everyday building in Dubai. They, ha they have two different rates for what they charge. One is iconic and one is not iconic. And the, all the local and regional architects do the do the non-iconic work, and then they bring in all the foreigners to do the iconic work. It's very strange. Uh, that is how it works. So the idea, the way it's built is incredibly simple, moving form, in situ, placed, developed, the structural cages on the outside tied back to the interior, to the core, and then the, the stairs are free flowing as it begins to move. So this is what it would look like, arm-shaped sides row. So remember, the, the, the formal arrangement, I, I don't like using the term, but I will tonight, is, is really a product of a lot of factors, of thinking. So it's not arbitrary, okay? So a lot of people or always somehow tend to dismiss anything they see that's curved, but actually it's not curved. So I wanna show you the pieces. So, <laughs> so there's straight pieces of glass that begin to operate in areas. And then there are, you know, so you can really see the straight line beginning to emanate. So it's, it's not an illusion, but it's really how you begin to bring these pieces together. And since there's 16 parts, like I was mentioning, we repeated each part twice. So we didn't have that much variation, but how, in that much variation in the manufacturing, but how you bring it together and assimilate the entire project is what deceives the eye into thinking that it's completely in variation. But there are only eight pieces that are repeating, right? And I think that's an incredibly important technique to achieve variation without paying a lot for it. <coughs> this is a view from Sheikh Zayed Road uh, looking up and you saw the other view which was from, which is from uh, the backside, actually the desert side, where now they've developed, and that's where the Burj is, etc. So that initial idea of the desert being transformed was my client saying, you know, if you buy a piece of land on Sheikh Zayed Road, they give you a parking garage in the back of the building. And so the garages are overbuilt in Dubai, tremendously in this area. 
And he said, let me just lease the garages for this building. And why don't we build another building behind it on that site? So he went to the, the authorities um, and, and tried to get the zoning variance to be able to do that. And he came back very frustrated, saying, you know, I spent a month there, I couldn't get anything done, we can't do that, that's really upsetting me. I said, all right, just fly me out there. I went there, I hired a local architect who's related to the Sheikh of Dubai, and it happened in two weeks, right? And that's how it works in Dubai. If the number plate is under three digits, they're very important, and those are the people you want to know there. And they get everything you want done. But that's how it works in Dubai. So you just have to know the system, right? Um, it's a little like Houston in that, in that uh, there are no zoning laws, really. Um, you can violate anything if you know the shape. The only thing there is you have to know the shape. And in Houston, it is, it's just economically based and driven. So I prefer the economic model. But the shape model tends to work a little uh, as well. So this is another project that we did. Um, and this is uh, in the marina. Actually, um, SOM started off on the plan, but then HOK got involved, then it got Madia and Madia and Madia. And that's unfortunately how things begin to occur in Dubai. And this is um, an area which is primarily residential, except for the perimeter, which is um, office building. And our client, said, you know, we've got, we've got this um, real issue. We have all these people moving in. They love Dubai, and now they want to start off offices, but the offices are failing. Can we come up with an idea for how to somehow brand the project in such a way that it doesn't fail? I mean, we'll sell it like that, but whether it does or doesn't, we're just going to have to play out. So I said, we can think about it. So we came up with a, an idea for a conference room, which is shared between two floors that really runs through the entire building. Now, once again, as I said, we're parametrically spatial. We really think about space and not just surface. So what we did was we allowed the relationship from the inside to the outside emanate. So it's a relationship, again, of how the tower begins to operate from the in to the out, and we studied how, how the conference rooms would begin to operate, and then what effects would occur on the facade, depending on the different spatial qualities we wanted to achieve and the different levels of um, ability for the client to be able to sell, um, sell this project in different ways. So we again looked at uh, how close the relationship was from the inside to the outside, and we realized that in all, in, in just life, right, if you eat four quarter pounders with cheese, you're not going to gain one pound. It just doesn't work like that. So the relationship <laughs> from the inside to the outside is not one to one. It's really about getting greasy hair and maybe breaking out, you know? <laughs> it's really not a direct relationship. So that's how we began to approach it. It's like, okay, parametrically, you can control the interior and then let it emanate at a different amplitude in the outside. And that's really what we did to control the aesthetic, aesthetic sensibility of the project. The other thing that we really looked at, again, it's an office building. So there are certain levels that you can rent offices for or sell the office space for. And all we did was we put money in to these seams. And those are the only areas in the project where it's not a flat surface, right? But the surface has enough depth to be able to create shadow and nuance on the facade. Now remember, in Dubai, oil is incredibly cheap still. So they're not interested in developing very sophisticated systems for the exterior because in the 20 year span, they'll never be able to pay for it. So they just like the project, to have very simple mechanisms, uh, not very ecologically friendly, and then just blast it with air conditioning. Um, it's unfortunate, but true. And our engineers have been there, they've spoken with them, they've tried to, uh, tried to persuade them that it doesn't have any foresight, but that's not the issue. Now, Abu Dhabi is taking a different route. 
they want to really build green. I just want to uh, show you one more uh, thing that uh, is not easy to do for us uh, in any case, is that the system of vehicles and parking, and this is parking and you're actually parking in the Plymouth, uh, in relation to a pedestrian organization to become continuous and seemly, seamlessly linked. So what we, what we do is we have to run these uh, parametrics many, many times to achieve all our goals for the outside, for how they work. There are ponds that we developed here to cool the inside um, because we refused to put air conditioning in a parking garage. Um, so we had to cool it um, sort of passively and we tried our best to do what we could. Um, but really the important part of this was to bring some of uh, this interactivity and then meld with the human interactivity on the interior of the base of the tower. So you can see how this, oops, this works and how the road system works and how one enters it. And so what the conference room does is it really addresses one of the issues of failure. So you can have a large office and a small office sharing the same conference room as in the, the intermediate floors with the intention that the small office will gain some knowledge from the large office. And that'll be helpful for their own development. And they might come up with interesting ideas, they might come up with goals that they didn't have before. So the idea was to somehow help and assist the smaller offices in developing uh, and sustaining themselves actually through time. So once again, we, uh, we look at the models and the models once again uh, are completely controlled much the same way in the project I showed you before and you can change the attributes. And what was driving this change were really the interior qualities. How much surface do we want covering particular uh, spaces? Do we want conference rooms to have lots of glass or be covered with just surface? Uh, protecting it from the sun and the development was that we had more surface and less surface so every floor was completely different so again tenants could begin to select okay in that area we want our computers but in another area we can have it open and the conference room can give us views to the outside etc so so we allowed that to self-regulate and as long as we had all the criteria that the client was interested in, we had achieved his goals. And we were able to achieve the difference in quality of the interior spatiality. So once again, all the panels are generated. So all the actual information is embedded, right? And the embedded information relates to not only the location of the panel in the entire system, but also what's next to it and above it. So, and as I was explaining, the, the, the facade system is incredibly simple. And once again, so all, all of the relationships are incorporated into um, um, these numbers, and this locates it next to itself, but also next to the next system. So the fiberglass panels on the outside and then the glass system, the mammalian system, and you'll notice all of these are generated from the same model. And also you can control the square footage of each piece of glass to make sure that it's not excessively large. So it's within normal standards and normal ways of beginning to <coughs> Um, it's always good to work with the limitations that are given to you. And all the glass in Dubai, well, in the iconic buildings, comes from Germany. Otherwise, it's uh, locally made or Chinese. <laughs> so this is where all the curtain wall framing system uh, comes together. And that's what it looked like when it does.
So once again, the, the continuity of uh, the tower and the system and how it operates in the landscape. And the, the, the notion of elegance I've tried to explain to you, it's, it's a lot about iteration, it's a lot about coherence, about how things come together. It's also about a particular sense of <coughs> knowing your goals for the project. Without knowing the goals for the project, you can tinker with these systems, but it may yield absolutely nothing. So you have to really guide them. It's really like shaping and guiding as opposed to starting over with a new idea. So you keep developing the idea as long as it begins to achieve your goals. If it doesn't achieve your goals, you have to change your idea. I mean, that's how it works. As long as it still holds your aesthetic sensibility as a and you work towards it, that's really a very important thing for our office. So how much variation can you build into a project and still maintain its elegance? And we ask that question of ourselves all the time. This is a view looking back to, uh, once again, the marina. But once again, the surfaces then are really crucial um, and how they produce almost flat surface with very thin slivers of glass versus very wide areas of glass um, where you, you probably will not put an office. And the office distribution would change depending on how the glass is located in relation to the floor slab. And just to really move through the quality very quickly. Um, so these are coming directly from the outside in. Uh, and this is the lobby. So it has uh, a presence about itself, as it has an openness about itself, um, but also the relationships of how the seeming are beginning to operate and migrate up into the roof or the ceiling surface, and how that line begins to die out and then begins to produce sort of a constellation lighting system to animate some of the surfaces below and activities below is uh, a lot about what we're thinking about. And as you move through, this is a conference room. So you can see the, the relationship here of how much surface there is versus glass, and it's a lot more surface re related to the lobby, but it also brings a peaceful environment where one can work. And the next is a quality that's Above. Now also, if you look at the mechanical systems, it's incredibly integrated with all the systems, all the uh, seaming, the joints, and um, the lighting systems. They all have to come together to begin to work, work in, a co in a coherent manner. And this is just a view from the rooftop, which would be the bar, and they have a whole facility behind um, <coughs> for dining. I just want to end very quickly with a project that we were commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art to do. The commission is very simple. They just said, you need to design a wall of the future. We just scratched our heads saying, what is that? What does that mean? So we began to look at techniques of construction that we feel will change architecture in the future. Not today, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years. And Baruch Khoshnevis is a the inventor of contour crafting, which is a big robot, similar to the robot I showed you actually at the beginning of this talk, but it can actually pour concrete. And so you can imagine that it can actually build your house. And his hypothesis is that you can build it in 30 hours. So imagine an integrated building with plumbing, HVAC systems, everything built in 30 hours. It's an interesting idea, and I think he's going to get there. But what we found, and we wanted to collaborate with him, but what we found was the intricacy that you can main, you're able to achieve with his system was not as intricate as we needed, because we only had, we were given the dimension. We were given 12 feet by nine feet by eight inches. That was it. They said, do something, walk with the future in those dimensions. And we just couldn't produce the intricacy that we wanted with this machine. So what we did was we sort out a, proto, a prototype of a very large printer 
a three-dimensional printer. It's much the same way as your inkjet works on paper, but it actually builds up the, the material into a third dimension. And because this was prototypical, there was nothing that was, um, was actually resolved. We, these pieces kept collapsing. We had to try new materials, new ways of coming together, etc. And it was all done on the fly. They would print it, we would look at it, we would collapse. Then we had to try and inject it with stiffeners, because these are very big pieces, so they had to hold their own weight. <coughs> So what we came up with was that we have to make it spatially so intricate. And it has to vary a lot so that if you try and build this by hand, it will take 10 years. And within that notion, we also just said, we still have to contain the variation with our own intentions. I.e., it has to be elegant at the end. So we went. And we just had to control through iteration once again until we got the maximum variation, which is elegant. And in it, we had spatial development. All the spaces were incredibly different. And this is, again, not only talking about our towers, but if you begin to think of the spatial spatiality, these could become surfaces and walls that, were, that, are, that are activated through water that can cool the building. So it has a lot of reasons for how it can begin to work. We were also interested in this notion of transparency, and we were really looking at a different range of transparency within, within our wall. But we were also looking at different qualities of geometry that make up the wall. So in areas, we have very very tightly controlled surfaces, right? Um, and very hard seams. In other areas, it's much looser, and you would co probably call this cute if you looked at it closely, <laughs> like Japanese anime, I think. Uh, and then the relationship and the variation between all of them. So if it, it transforms in this way as well as that way. If you begin to look at this unit versus that unit is vastly different. So once again, it's going to, we can produce a variation, but we really feel that in 20 years, you'll be able to print your home with all the plumbing and everything incorporated into it. And the back was in, it was serious because we did exactly the same thing. Remember the eight inches. So in eight inches, we had to vary a tremendous amount in this direction, across the wall, to produce a very different sensibility on the other side. So in case you're outside a building versus inside a building, you can really control the sensibility of the surface of the wall. And it's also a knock on some of my colleagues who do a lot of self-similar work, because Self-similarity meaning the unit changes in quantity, but never changes in quality, right? But if you look here, so they all came up to me at the opening saying, ah, it's self-similar. And I was like, okay, come, let me show you how it's not self So I took them to one area, and I said, look at that, now come here, it's completely different. Look at the spaces on the inside, it's completely changing, and they bought it. So the structure then also varies. And the, the way the structure operates is it migrates through the wall. And again, Arab, who actually funded this, also did a lot of tests of the structure and how the structure actually migrated through the wall. That was one of our goals. And I should also really, Z, Z Corporation is who we worked with, uh, and they funded this project in addition to Arab. I know it's really amazing. Uh, it's an amazing collaboration. This is in the space, and it was done for uh, an exhibition called Home Delivery. So we took delivery incredibly importantly, and we said that in, we have to be able to install this in under 15 minutes. Uh, and we have other colleagues who also did two other walls in, for this um, exhibition, and one took one week, and the other one took three weeks to install. So I think that the 15 minutes Barry Bogdall, the curator, 
love that intention. We said, wow, it, it just appeared. And we said, that's the intention, is that it, when you do this on the site, it's going to happen so fast that it has the potential of changing architecture culture, as we know, it, with regards to manufacturing. <clears throat> So what I wanted to do was to really just leave you with this. It's something to always test and challenge. We know where we're at today. We know what we can build. We know we can control the surfaces. We know we can control the structure within the budget. But I have a feeling that these printing technologies that have been developed currently, uh, and the more sophisticated and the more the material develops, and it's all happening, because I saw it happen in front of my eyes a year ago, they'll just become more and more interesting, and they'll begin to change and be able to alter architecture, uh, manufacturing, and, and a way of delivering projects. We, all, we already see two things changing, if you work this way. I mentioned one, which is a project um, manager somehow becomes more, um, it's, a, it's a different role for them. Uh, it just allays fears of cost, but they then begin to collaborate with these people and still deliver the project in a budget, which is agreed to day one. The second thing I've noticed um, in the Tokyo project uh, particularly is that the system, the parametric system that we developed is so intricate because there's so many constraints in it that the local architect couldn't understand the constraints. And so whenever he tried changing something because of site dimensions, etc., we had to actually rerun the entire system. So it sort of rendered him slightly, he was incredibly important for the project, don't get me wrong, he could speak English for a while, which is really helpful, but, but he was um, very limited with his ability to make decisions because he didn't know what the correct decision was. So that empowers architects and designers, and I think that's a great thing to think about as if, uh, in the future, particularly for students, and I'm excited to see what that may hold for us. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I'm happy to respond. Yeah. What are the materials that you build your walls with? The the this all oh. exterior and interior. What yeah, I, I mentioned right. We use fiberglass. We use glass. Um, the first tower is concrete, and it's clad again with um, uh, the structure is made of mesh steel and reinforced with rebar so the tension and compression operate simultaneously. It's a general question and every project is different, but uh, rebar, for example, had um, fiberglass, uh, wood floor, uh, stairs of wood that are milled in Tokyo. It's wood and calcium silicate panels in, uh, in the wall, it's, uh, it's a hybridized material. It's new materials, actually, which they're currently inventing um, at BA BASF in, in Germany. So it's kind of injection-based materials that change their material qualities so that as you begin to print something, they solidify immediately so that they can begin to hold their own structural capacity and weight. So it integrates structure and material so the, it's very different, and it, it goes across. Mm -hmm. um, each project brings its own opportunities and its own problems and its own cost issues, etc. So you just work with what, what you can to develop the project. Yeah. Actually, both. It has breaks both ways. And it's a, it, it's, it's a fascinating machine. I mean, it's, uh, 
they had never tested it. They had done their own little test, but this is the first time they actually tested something in a large scale. Um, yes? How much did that wall weigh when you were done? That's a good question. It weighed, I know this. Um, it wasn't that heavy, um, quite honestly. I mean, it's less than a sculpture that they've taken in out every day. They were just basically moved it in and moved it out. They had, uh, it was basically on wheels, so they just moved it in. And then eight, eight um, union people uh, who do all the work on the inside of the MoMA lifted it and put it on the ground. And then there's a structure in the base. We wanted the wall to continue on the base, but the legal department at the MoMA said, you know, if someone runs into the wall, it has to stay up. And that's your issue. So the base actually has, um, so we, we couldn't turn the corner, and the base has a structure in it, which is then camouflaged with the base itself so that it, it wouldn't tilt. But it's, it wasn't very, it, I mean, it's heavy, don't get me wrong. But for art installations and sculptural installations, it was not heavy. Um, we use everything. Um, we we move from um, Avia Studio to manufacture. Uh, we go back into Maya, into Rhino, into Grasshopper, into I mean we just cross platforms uh, as necessary. Um, Rhino we find really limiting, so we try not using it as much as we can. But it's also really good for. If you develop a three-dimensional project, it's really good for line drawings. So once again, we move in different platforms, uh, and it also depends on how it, the project is being delivered, right? So you have um, in Tokyo, they really wanted MiniCAD, and I was like, are you kidding, MiniCAD? Um, what is that? I thought that was gone 20 years ago. And uh, so, so we had to then work backwards. We reverse engineered what we would work with so that it was compatible with MiniCAD. Um, and actually, you know, all of those drawings, uh, all of those drawings were done uh, using Alias Wavefront, Alias Studio now. Yes? Um, I wonder, I'm going to ask a question about how you see yourself, your work in a sort of larger context. Um, and Maybe I'll get Chris to answer that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's perfect, uh, particularly being in a museum building right now. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, and because through the lecture, you're talking so much about detail of one, and also the quality of the space. Yes. Which is a sort of modest, right? A modest, I think. And um, I, so it's interesting to me to see a relationship of a very modest idea in work that seems so radically not modest. When it also I don't think anything is new. I mean, quite honestly, uh, that's given, I think the parametrics uh, changes the way we think. Uh, I would say that the qualities, um, particularly with the addition of the virtual capacities that I was talking about a little earlier, does differentiate it from uh, the modernist history that we've all grown up with and learned through. Um, is it new? I just think there are more things being brought to the fore. That's all. I think there are more issues that can influence um, occupation um, that we're bringing to the fore. And I don't, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about the whole constellation of people working this way. And I think that the way we try and differentiate ourselves from most is working spatially. That's why I was so it was so important for me to show you spaces, even in the wall, the spaces. We don't work superficially at all and ever and ever think about it. So if you work spatially, the parametrics gets incredibly complicated. 
because you have more than one variant. You have two or three variants. One variant, two variants, I don't know what the decision is. So a lot of offices use them to assist in manufacturing something they've already designed. We don't see it there that way. We see it as more as a virtu um, an actualization process, which is back and forth from the, from the initial goal and interests and development of this aesthetic of an idea all the way through its manufacturing, and then the manufacturing ripples all the way back through the building, and vice versa. So the actualization then is, and how do you begin to weigh in on that? Well, the numerical operates in the shape and form of the building as I said, and then the, the affects operate on kind of how you feel, you know. I don't know if you've ever walked through, well, again, uh, an, an old, an old uh, example I'm going to give you, but the Saren and uh, TWA tunnel, I remember the tubes I walked through there and I felt glamorous, you know. There were, I felt like, wow, I'm flying, I love it, you know. <laughs> and I never feel that way because I travel way too often. So it is really that's what we're trying to bring to the fore much more is to have this have people be influenced by the spaces that we produce and have people really uh, develop uh, a different kind of atmosphere or a different emotional affect to the work and that comes with controlling the virtual capacity not only through light and shadow but through the material condition through how much it's how much it's inflected and that all comes together in influencing how people begin to feel in the spaces and how you know one wants to operate within it so I feel that our work because it's elegant has to be slightly formed but elegance also for us is about training it's about the ability to learn and to develop an aesthetic much the same as a ballerina can learn how to dance, right? It's through a lot of iteration, it's through a lot of um, re repetition, etc., just to get to the base level. And then you have, so you have to learn how to walk before you can begin to run, right? And then you can begin to bring in the aesthetic sensibility, and then you guide that sensibility into what experiences you want to develop and produce. And so, because of our elegant notion, we want you know, a sophisticated, formal experience. Yes? Um, what are you seeing kind of metrics in the smaller scale right now, like you know, for individual projects and installations? Do you see it being used for larger things like urban design, like city? Absolutely. I've run, I mean, absolutely. Are you familiar with some of the work that Zaha Hadid has done in Istanbul? There are large master plans that are completely controlled parametr parametrically. The variation in the quality of spaces is, uh, you know, is something she's still developing, but she's definitely working parametrically in those projects. So absolutely, on an urban scale, uh, abs uh, you know, it just depends on how you build the scale up, right? or you build it down. The intentions have to be clear, otherwise you'll get completely lost. But I've run uh, urban studios at Penn, um, and we've used parametrics to develop the outcomes. And, yeah. and what we focus on really is about a change in the quality. Because in an urban condition, it really has to radically change. Otherwise, it becomes really boring. So that's you know my whole jab about self-similar work. Right, is that especially at an urban scale, if it's self similar, the experience is almost the same as the experience you just had. And as you know, what makes the city great is the very experiences vehicles, pedestrians, train lines. So, how do all of these operate to complement each other in a coherent manner? And how do we as designers need to approach that problem? Thank you very much. Thank you.